The following program is shot in 4K high dynamic range and broadcast in high definition from Capital Broadcasting Company. immigrants coming to North Carolina, this may be the first image that comes to mind. I couldn't do it without them. Many Hispanic migrant workers end up settling here, becoming legal immigrants to North Carolina. They're here to stay, and we we need to recognize that and do all we can to integrate them into our, our culture. And many of them work in very different kinds of fields. Doctors, lawyers, accountants, journalism. They contribute billions to our state's economy. We found that for every dollar the state spends for K-12 education, health care and corrections, we uh, get $11 back in business revenue and taxes from the Hispanic Latino population. But the controversy over immigrants here illegally ignites fiery rhetoric. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. And Hispanic immigrants say that kind of talk casts a shadow over those who are here legally, too. There is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of fear. And a lot of misconceptions, like Hispanics taking Americans' jobs. The jobs are, are opening, and a lot of, unfortunately, Americans don't want to do them, you know. There is something Hispanic immigrants want you to know. All of us have one thing in common. We are here to work, to work hard, and, and give the best of what we have. Everything cranked back up. Jose Calderon is the sales manager for one of the largest sweet potato growers and exporters in North Carolina. He works in this office now. Ay, ay, ay. But this is where he started in the fields. What we call the buckets, you know, they get heavy after doing it many, many, many times. The more buckets you do, the more money you earn, and so you work hard. Jose grew up in Costa Rica, where he started working on banana, coffee, and pineapple plantations. Very much I grew up in it. You know, it was, it was the summer jobs. You know, after school, I had to go and, and work in a farm. Very hot conditions, very humid areas. One of my goals was go to school so I didn't have to work in agriculture anymore. Jose got three college degrees and set his sights on the United States. It was one of the dreams since I was a kid, very, very young. Um, I always heard about Ronald Reagan and the country doing so well and doing, doing very well. So I wanted to be part of it. He came to North Carolina in 2001 to work for Barnes Farming in Nash County. I met Carson Barnes, the founder of the company, when I was eight years old. He gave me his business card and he told me, he said, when you grow up, call me. And that's what I did. Barnes hired Jose to pick sweet potatoes. My English was terrible. You know, imagine I still got an accent 16 years later. I uh, did not speak English when I came, so couldn't expect it too much. Barnes eventually put Jose in charge of coordinating the labor during harvest. So when I was done with the labor coordinator part, I would go into the packing house and, and learn them you know, different sizes and different packs and start getting ideas of what to do with them. He was also learning English by taking classes at Nash Community College. Plus, I kind of forced myself to mingle with the Americans and English-speaking people, not so much with the Latino community. So I got into the culture, learned the culture, and, and learned the language because I knew that'd be the only way I can, can move up, you know, start understanding more of, of what America is about. Was it hard learning English? Was that the most yes. challenging part? <laughs> I would say yes, it was, it was, it's hard. And still, you know, sometimes I still have to go into the dictionary or, or ask to my coworkers, hey, well, how do you spell this, you know? In 2007, Barnes offered Jose a sales position. He still struggled with his English and his heavy accent. And something just hit my, my brain and says, in Europe, everybody has an accent. 
they, everybody speak English with accent. And that's what I started doing. I started making phone calls and waking up two, three o'clock in the morning to call Europe and finally got one interested into it and we make the first sale. He's able to relate to a lot of our foreign customers, especially the ones who have uh, a Hispanic background. Uh, you know, when he talks to the guys over in Europe, he's able to relate well with them. He has a global perspective of, th of things and business and agriculture. While Americans prefer large sweet potatoes, Jose discovered that Europeans, who tend to eat smaller portions, like the smaller potatoes that Barnes Farming was mostly throwing away. And now it's pretty much flipped the other way around. You know, it's like, it's more demand for those smaller sizes than there is for the number one. Thanks to the European markets, Jose worked to open. We tripled the sales. He has spearheaded that, not just uh, for our company, but also uh, for the industry. And the industry took notice. Jose is a member of the American Sweet Potato Marketing Institute and the North Carolina Sweet Potato Commission. And last year, Governor Roy Cooper appointed him as the first Hispanic member of the North Carolina Board of Agriculture. Be the first, the first Hispanic is, is huge. Um, especially when you come here with no expectations. In agriculture, if it wasn't for the contribution of the Hispanics, operations such as ours or practically any sweet potato farm here in North Carolina would not be able to operate. They have a strong work ethic. They're Christian people. They're, they're hardworking. Uh, they share a lot of the same ethics that, uh, that we do right here. Many Hispanic workers like Jose choose to stay. He's earned permanent resident status and is working towards citizenship. Barnes Farming promoted him to sales manager, running its sales and marketing arm called Farm Pack Products. Nail, three points. In his time off, Jose likes to relax at his home in Cary and spend time with his son. There's a reason why we come to this country, because it was better than where we were. If it was better where we were, we would stay there. And he has a message for other immigrants. Respect where you're coming to learn the culture, learn the language, learn the habits of the people. Next, an immigrant who helped start an organization for Hispanic professionals and a look at the overall impact of Hispanic immigrants on our state's economy. This population is contributing to the growth and the future competitiveness of our state and our nation. What's done? Bien. Marco Zadate is an Apex resident and environmental consultant. He works for a Fortune 500 engineering company. I do environmental audits, uh, also uh, help industry to be in compliance with environmental regulations, uh, specifically air. He was born one of six children in the industrial port of Tampico, Mexico. At home there was an any questions if we were going to go to college or not. We were going to go. <laughs> Marco earned an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering in Mexico, but decided to go to NC State to earn his graduate degree in industrial engineering. He met his wife in Raleigh and moved back to Mexico to start a family. And after eight years, uh, we decided to come back to the United States. And to North Carolina. After one year, North Carolina was home for me. They wanted to separate and become another country. Marco's wife, Susan, took a job as an ESL teacher for Wake County Public Schools back in the early 1990s. That's when a wave of Hispanic immigrants came to our state. She saw the struggles of our public schools to try to serve this student population. This amendment. But the investment our state makes in Hispanic immigrants and their children is far outweighed by the return. That's shown in a UNC Keenan Flagler Business School study that used 2010 data. We found that for every dollar the state spends for K-12 education, health care and corrections, we uh, get $11 back in business revenue and taxes from the Hispanic Latino population. Hispanic buying power in North Carolina had an annual economic impact of over $10 billion. That helped create 92,000 additional jobs, which generated more than $460 million in state and local taxes. 
at the lower end of the economy, at the upper end of the economy, and everything in between, you have uh, Hispanic Latino populations uh, infused throughout our economy. They're core to our economy. While most Hispanic immigrants work in farming, construction, manufacturing, food processing, and other blue collar jobs, many of their children are headed in new directions. So you've had a whole generation of kids who were born here in our state that have aged into the college class and, and the professional class and so are beginning to diffuse into our economy and all sectors of the economy, from public education to corporate America and everything in between. Johnson says Hispanic immigrants tend to be younger and reproduce at higher rates than non-Hispanic Americans. He says they will be key to our future workforce needs and our ability to pay into programs like Social Security and Medicare. We're going to need this, this population and their children to propel our state and our nation moving forward. And he says the same is true of most of the undocumented immigrants already living and working here. If they have not otherwise broken the law, we should find a pathway to citizenship for them, largely because we're going to need them in our economy. I mean, can you imagine sending, ripping all these people out of their homes and sending them to another country? What would that would do to the schools, to the social fabric, to the families, to the economy? It's just not realistic. Marco Zarate wants to help the children of Hispanic immigrants get a good education. In 1999, he and his wife helped found the North Carolina Society for Hispanic Professionals. Marco serves as its volunteer president. The society's mission is promoting education for Hispanic students. There are other professional organizations that they do professional development for, for their members, but in our case, the thought was Latinos are new in North Carolina, so we need to help these children. Especially Hispanic children at risk of dropping out of school. Some of these students, they don't feel uh, welcome. They didn't feel welcome in the school. Uh, they didn't feel that the school was embracing them. Since the formation of the organization, the dropout rate among Hispanic students has been cut in half. Every year, more and more Latino students are graduating from high school. They do a fantastic job, and I support them 100%. Maru Quintero is a member of the North Carolina Society of Hispanic Professionals. She's a journalist and Spanish voiceover talent from Venezuela. She now lives and works in Durham. She says the society's efforts at providing scholarships and career guidance is important to Hispanic students. Because not all the Hispanic community comes with the resources to study. So with a little bit of supporting, we could push the kids in the Hispanic market to move forward, move forward, move forward. The world is so competitive, and we have to be ready for that. Quintero says there are many misconceptions and stereotypes about Hispanic immigrants. We have been seen like that we are taking our things from America instead of we are supporting the society and we are giving as well. Quintero says many Hispanic immigrants feel a strong desire to counter that by exceeding people's expectations. When you're an immigrant, you have to be a better person in all matters. As a professional, as a person, as a parent, as a, as a citizen, as everything. That, she says, helps counter some of the negative attitudes toward Hispanic immigrants. The recent uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric that we hear nowadays uh, for sure is impacting uh, Hispanics here in North Carolina. Zanate says it's creating fear and uncertainty, but he says that too can be cured with education. Especially highlighting the contributions that, that Hispanics are doing. Hispanics are building America. Next, teaching generations of non-Hispanic students to have a broader global view. They are embracing a diversity.
To watch the WRAL documentary Land of Opportunity on demand anytime, go to WRALdocumentary.com and all of these streaming platforms. There you will also find exclusive bonus video, including personal stories of discrimination from Jose Calderon. We were not welcome as easy or as uh, polite as maybe immigrants in other countries. And Maru Cantero. And he was actually looking at us like, hey, you are not like welcome. Like intimidating us. Yes. You can also join the conversation about this issue by following WRAL Doc on Facebook and Twitter. Claudia Casco grew up in Guadalajara, Mexico. She went to a French immersion school from kindergarten through high school. So I was uh, immersed always in an international um, and global uh, education, always um, learning new ways of life, new food, new languages, new, new opportunities. In Mexico, Claudia helped run a Montessori school while her husband Gerardo worked for IBM. He was able to travel and to, to know more about the world. In 2001, IBM transferred Gerardo to New York. And then four years later to North Carolina, Claudia came with him. I decided to open um, a, a small preschool in my house. It was a Montessori school with just seven students. It was amazing and, and it started to grow and to grow until I, I, I needed to rent a bigger house. <laughs> Eventually, Claudia rented a building in North Raleigh for her Maracas Montessori School. She now has 100 students. Gerardo helps manage the finances and does the marketing. He started to, to get more involved in, 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 until the point I asked him to quit his job. This is for cantar campana navideña is me. Maracas is a full Spanish immersion school. It is far beyond that learning another way to communicate. It goes beyond that because when you learn another language, you are learning another way to interact with others. You are learning um, oh, the point of view of others. How does that make you feel being an immigrant, coming from Mexico and having a successful business? So I was scared about the business itself because I was promoting the Spanish speaking uh, um, language. So I was said, oh, maybe somebody's gonna come and say, you have to close your doors because you are really pushing for, for another language that is not the, the English language. Does it hurt when you hear some of the anti-immigrant sentiment? Yes, yes, and, and it hurts because there's a lot of immigrants that have not the opportunity like I had it or we had it. Uh, less educated people and um, they look different. They, they, are, they, they don't have the same opportunities and they are my people too. One of the missions of this school is to help raise generations of students who will learn not to discriminate or stereotype people who are different from them. About 70% of the parents who bring their children here are non-Hispanic. Those families are looking for those things for their children. They want them to be a different generation, a different, uh, uh, global citizens. Are you going to put the last piece in? Families like Michael and Ashley Busey and whose children, Keller and Lachlan, go to Maracas. Language in different languages is a, a way to understand diversity and to understand that all people aren't the same and they might sound a bit different, they may look a little bit different, um, but they're fundamentally human. Rafaelina is from Guatemala. Uh, where's Guatemala? It just breaks down barriers. You know, what you don't know sometimes seems scary and you can create these artificial divides between two cultures that don't live there. But as soon as you start to engage with someone, they become human first. The Buseys know Claudia and Gerardo's contribution to their community and our state goes far beyond running a business that employs 19 people. There's no doubt that immigrants who come into this country and just actively get involved, just like Gerardo and Claudia are doing, just lifts up all of us and makes us all better. Overall, I think that we are a positive, a positive sector of the, of the population that gives a lot of good things, a lot of good things to the country. We are here to work, to work hard, to give our best. We are passionate people, we are committed people. 
with their children following in their footsteps. While Claudia and Gerardo's youngest child is still in grade school, their eldest two both graduated from UNC. The son is an analyst for a digital marketing agency, and the daughter is a Montessori school teacher. They grew up here, so all the, the culture, American culture, is inside them. Marco and Susan have a daughter who's a nurse at UNC hospitals and a son who's in the U.S. Army. As a Hispanic, it cannot get better than that. Maru's daughter is going to college and working as a barista. She wants to learn more about coffee and even judge international competitions. And then my biggest thing would be like open up a shop of my own, something that is not only self-sustained but also helps the community. I just want her to be happy. Whatever she wanted to do, I just want her to be happy. Jose Calderon's 13-year-old son has big plans too. For future jobs, I have like two ideas. One, a robotic scientist, and if that doesn't go that well, then cook. His dad says the young Jose is good at technology and math. He has the doors wide open. You know, he needs he just need to focus and get it done. I think he he can do whatever he wants to do. Really, you know, it's no limits. And if he succeeds as a robotic scientist, try to make my own company. That will be a long way from the farm fields where his father started.